Talking fishing, talking fishing, nothing but fishing, talking fishing. If it's facts about fishing that you want to know, then tune in, folks, because this is the show. We'll show you all the right bait to use. So sit right back, you got nothing to lose. Doesn't really matter if it's trout or cop, flathead marlin or a gummy shark. Listen to the guys and you can't go wrong. They'll be talking about fishing till the cows come home. Talking fishing, talking fishing, nothing but fishing, we're talking fishing. And welcome everyone to Talking Fishing, a big show coming up with all the regular segments plus a bit of talk about snapper rigs. The last thing you want this time of year is a knot or a rig breaking on you. Adam, you're going to show us a few things about snapper rigs. Yeah, thanks Dave. I'm going to show you all a little something that Paul taught me just a little while ago to make sure that you don't drop that fish of a lifetime boat side. Paul Worsley? Paul Worsley. I've seen him drop a few. The Paul Worsley. He's now got on to a couple of new <laughs> things. And uh, by popular demand, Trelly is back. Welcome Trelly. Thank you very much, David. I tell you what, superstar, the amount of mail that we've had about you in the previous week has just been unbelievable, <laughs> Trelly. It's, uh, yeah, I'm I'd, sure. I'd say it's probably not filtering quite up to Shepparton, but uh, the boys in Geelong and yeah. Lavin, I think they've been harassed this week. So Might have to get a bigger bag. Yeah, you might have to get a bigger bag. <laughs> boys, uh, the wind, uh, we've had a fair bit of wind in the last you know, couple of weeks really now. Um, all those settled conditions that we had for you know five or six weeks on end, I think it was, throughout... September and, and early October and uh, certainly we're right into the spring and a bit of wind but good for the land based and good for you know the guys that can get out in the bigger boats and the, you know everything's stirred up some beautiful snapper around. Yeah well, the land based guys are really loving it at the moment they don't they don't mind the winds they almost it's almost the opposite to the guys in the boats they look at the forecast and hope for the wind but I think the, the biggest part of it's probably the rain um, the rain's a good thing it helps that water temp just kick up Nice and nice and slowly gives us that little kick, stirs up the water a little bit. It can only be a good thing. Only a matter of time we're going to see some of the big catches come in. Oh, yeah. when, when I say that, I mean obviously there's some big fish around, but uh, yeah, you know, the days where you can go out and have a really good session, 20, 30 fish, uh, only you know days if not yeah, you know right. maybe a week or two away. So yeah. water temperature starting to come up. Trelly up your neck of the woods, Shepparton. Uh, I know it's closed season for cod, but a few yellow belly around. Yeah, we're seeing some good catches come in with some good, really good reports coming from over at Eildon Way. Mm. And this time of year, like you say, it's a bit like the, the bay with a bit of a uh, raise in temperature of the water. Mm. Uh, it's really sort of kicking things on, so it's going quite well. So is that typical for this time of year, Trelly? The yellow's starting to get about, or is it a bit yeah. early? Or Almost like you guys with um, snapper. It's like clockwork with the yellow belly up there. Yeah. Um, again, your weather uh, conditions help. So uh, we've had a bit of wind too at the same time, but uh, a bit different to up there. You've got Lake Eild and those sort of places. You can sneak yeah. around the corner and get away from it. Yeah. 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 Um, yellow belly, just t talking about those. Mm. Um, I, someone asked me the other day, what do they like to eat? <coughs> can you tell me? Yeah, it, it, depends, it depends on where you actually catch them. So if you catch them in a creek where it's a muddy water, yeah. they tend to sort of taste a bit muddy. Eildon's quite good. It's nice clean water. Nalakuti, Ranga Basin, those sort of areas are really good. Again, it, it depends on the size. It's a bit like... You know, a lot of fish, once they get really big, they get a lot more sort of fat content. Well, well content so someone said that exactly to me, that yeah. uh, if you get them coming out of winter, they're quite fatty and maybe not as tasty as you get them in, say, yeah. autumn when they've come through summer, they've lost a lot of their body fat. Is that right? Yeah, it could be because what they feed on, because during the winter months, you uh, see okay, all yeah, your yeah. bait disappear, like your yabbies and shrimp, that type of thing. Yep. So they're probably feeding on other things on the bottom like that. Mm. Uh, whereas you get your spring time and through summer, you've got all your yabbies and all your baits out. So the, the yellow belly will be f probably feeding on things a lot cleaner. So yeah, but yeah. anything from about 30 centimetres to 45 centimetres is a good uh, fish to eat. Yep. Uh, anything over that, you could pretty much put it back in. What's your best way to cook them? Cook them. Yeah. Um, we usually just fill them out and um, breadcrumbs, uh, garlic, uh, a bit of parsley, okay. and uh, just uh, egg and just, just fry them like that. But yeah. I, I like them just sort of natural, just with a, a bit of butter or a bit of ghee yeah. uh, in a frying pan. A bit of what? The, a bit of ghee. Bit which, of ghee. Which, is, which is an extract of butter, taking all the oh, bad stuff out there. Really? There you go. go. Trelly's yeah. homebrew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> homebrew butter, yeah. only from Trelly. <laughs> no, you can, get it, you can get it around. But um, I often find that people, when they cook fish, they like to put it with a curry or bread crumb and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Yeah. They actually, you want to taste the fish as it comes out of the water. So, you know, as little as influence as you can get on mm. the cooking process, yeah. you get to actually taste what yeah. the fish is. I actually. agree with that, especially if you've never eaten it before. Absolutely. You, you want to actually know what the fish tastes like yeah. rather yeah. than adding all your bits and pieces and, and mm. you know, not really tasting what the flesh is like at all. Yeah. Boys, time to talk fishing. Let's have a look at some of the catches of the week. And first up, 
Uh, Morty Alec, 12 metres of water has just been sensational. Steve Scusis, I think that's how you pronounce it. A couple of crackers there, boys. Wow. Uh, 12 metres of water has just been really good. On those days after we've had a fair blow, some really nice snapper coming in. Uh, and, you know, I think we were talking earlier on about, you know, in previous episodes about just how good some of the photos are these days yeah, of fish definitely. and people really taking their time. Mm. You know, the old holding the two up like that close yeah. to the camera. It's a great way to photograph snapper. Well, especially when they're the size of the ones that Steve was just yeah. showing. Mm. They're, they're big fish. They are. They're good fish. So, and I think uh, plenty more of that year class coming through. Yeah. Uh, next one, a few kids got out with Jason Turner from Pro Red Fishing Charters. Had an absolute ball. In fact, Jason said it's one of the m very most memorable trips that he's ever had. Christopher, Emily, Oliver and Michael. They got snap at a 7.1 kilos. And there's a fair bag there, boys, if you have a look at that. Wow. Uh, Carum, 18 metres. The biggest 7.1. I'll tell you what, for four little kids yeah. like that, they just had a, a ball on those fish and uh, stretched the biceps a little bit, I think. Yeah, I reckon. And I think that's... That deep water, I mean, leading up... It's a little bit different now that we've had the blow and we've had the rain, but leading up to that with a series of calm weather, yeah. the fish already in that size are schooling up pretty big in that deep water and we've seen it right throughout the bay, which we'll talk about later yeah. on. But um, what a bag. Yeah, absolutely. What a bag. If you want to have a look at some really nice little bit of uh, footage... Uh, Jason Turner's got it up on his Facebook page, a little film clip of those kids bringing in some of the snappers. So awesome. very, very, very exciting. Next one up, uh, let's head over to Western Port Hastings. James Lenati, a very nice snapper indeed. Uh, view, again, very, very beautiful photo and a cracking snapper for Hastings. I see, is, um, is there a part of Western Port at the moment where they're not getting no. snapper that big? No. Uh, it's pretty insane. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty and Charlie, I know Western Port's a little bit away from your neck of the woods, yeah. but you know it's fished just beautifully right yeah, through yeah. winter. It's it's really you know it's in its peak right now, and and a lot of fish coming through. Yeah, let's just hope good it holds looking, on. Good looking fish too. Yeah. Yeah. Really, so really. They start good off shallow fish. and go to deeper water, do they? Is the season yeah, then it, or? Who, the snapper? Yeah. Um, I think it changes with the weather, you know. So yeah. you get those real big blows and the cover and the murky water. They do come up and feed and okay, uh, yeah. I won't give too much away but they're caught in quite shallow water yeah, when yeah, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. the guys that really know how to target them at night shallow water yeah. um, you've got to know the grounds but yeah. um, you know absolutely so uh, another Western Port fish Joe's Island 62 centimetre uh, snapper caught by Rowan Geimer and another cracker fish not as big um, but very nice indeed and the 62 centimetres I reckon it fits in a Weber very very oh, nicely yeah. the big snapper beacon knows of Joe, known as Joe's Island so see those school yeah. fish are moving in now and schooling up pretty big. Yeah, yeah. Those fish, Trelly, like you were talking earlier yeah. on about the yellow belly cooking, you know, snapper, yeah. I don't think is the most, you know, it's not a five star fish no. for cooking, no. but yeah. you do need to do a little bit to it. But yep. fresh is absolutely superb. You know, a little bit of spice, a bit of lemon juice and butter and something like that. Yeah. And and quite often in in, um, in the Weber's very, very nice, but also in the smoker. It's a beautiful mm. fish to it is, smoke. Yeah, it is a beautiful smoker. Yeah, yeah, obviously yeah, that I puts that flavour flavour through it. Yeah, I found it a bit dry, but I don't know whether I've had sort of fresh snapper. Yeah. So, yeah, but interesting on those reports. How come some people measure them in... Centimetres and, and kilos. And then centimetres. I, <laughs> I think they're for a bit light, you go to centimetres and oh, they right. sound longer. So. <laughs> I think it would be bigger. And uh, last but not least, Chris Cherit, a lovely 5.07 kilo snapper trilly. There you go. We've gone back to kilos yeah. and centimetres. <laughs> yeah. uh, five kilos straight. is a fair fish. And you now, look, um, Rowan's one was probably four, four and a half. But mm. if you you know you want to get over the five, then you start going to centimetres. Sort of yeah. thing. So, yeah. But this is, that's this a nice fish. And that's how spoiled we are. We, we're looking at a five kilo snapper just over and going, oh, yeah, no. It's just another fish that we see frequently at this time of year. But five kilos, it's a big snapper. It's not well, a pinky. Well, the old measurement was about 12, 13 pounds. Yeah, it's mm. a good so, fish. Mm. You know, you it's a great fish. You can also say Coronella. People just really need to be patient down there because uh, it, it's turned out to be the Patterson Lakes, yep. um, you know, of Western Port mm. now. It's uh, an hour-long queue to get your boat in and out of the water and, and a little bit mm. frustrating for some of the guys that... <coughs> You know, are getting down there after work and going, beauty, yeah. let's get out in the snap. I've got a few uh, beers and yeah. you want to get out there after work. Yeah. And, you know, very, very long queues. But anyway, that's the way it is. If you'd like to send in a pick of your catch of the week, this is what you have to do. If you want to be like me and have your photo on TV, email your fishing pick to info at ifish.com.au. And coming up on Talking Fishing, product of the week, and Adam runs us through the best Port Phillip Bay snapper rig right after this. Talking Fishing. Talking Fishing. Product of the week. Brought to you by Tackle World. Now with eight great locations around Victoria. 
Tackle World, where our advice is priceless. That's why it's for free. See you down at Tackle World today. Now, boys, swivels aren't swivels, are they? Oh, there's way too many to snaps choose from. Aren't, these snaps, <laughs> swivels aren't swivels. Uh, there's a whole lot of different varieties on uh, the market these days. And, Ads, you're going to take us through a few of those. Yeah, there's quite a few on the market these days, and it can get a little bit daunting and a little bit out of control trying to pick them all. But I'm going to start firstly with this little breed and snap. Now, we sell a truckload of these mm. through the stores where we are, and, and trolley, I'm sure, through Laverton and Geelong yeah. is we sort of same. Yep. We use them predominantly for squid jigs. Uh, and unlike your normal snap, you don't have to actually undo them. And Dave, you've got a little bit of a, a demo there with a with an icker jig there that's got one already on the front. I'm going to try and get it out of the packet. <laughs> you can see I'm well organised, and I'll yeah. try not to prick myself. But the the breed and snap is just absolutely brilliant. I'm going to put my glasses on because uh, the old <laughs> eyesight's not quite as good as what it used to be. But basically, to get that squid jig uh, on and off is a, is just an easy little roll. And I'm going to make, mess this up. Yeah, well, there's a tiny lip basically on, I guess, on the main part of the the snap, which just connects down to the main shaft. You don't have to undo it. Now, this makes it mm. quite easy so, and it's quite handy. So I'll show this if uh, if you can have a look at this. It's roll it on, and it's on. And like I said, you've got to have really good eyesight to see it. And I'm going to muck it up again, and you roll it off. You roll it off, yeah. It's so it's quite easy. Yeah, it's quite easy. It's Listen, apart from squid jigs... There you go. Yeah. Quite easy. Yeah. Only, took me, only took me 25 seconds we're almost, each time. We're, we're so. almost into the next segment, um, Dave. But it, yeah, but right it is. It's a really good thing for attaching your squid jigs. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, how do you tie your squid jigs on? Don't use a breed yeah, and snap. Yeah, that's right. And now it, we understand that it can get a little bit fiddly, especially when your fingers when, are cold and No, when you've got old blokes you, with bad eyesight like me. And you can't, and you can't see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why um, there is an alternative in the egg snaps. Yeah. These are a little bit different, again, to, I guess, what you normally see. Um, the, I guess the small end you tie your, your main line to, and it really bellies out into a nice, big, open snap at the end, which makes it a little bit easier to get on and off. Uh, so again, you've actually got to unclip that one? Yeah, you do have to yep. unclip this one. So I guess if you, if you suffer a bit from arthritis on those cold mornings, they're probably not the snap for you, but they're a good alternative yeah, to the The old brass. Be, um, yeah, it would be fair to say that that style of clip on a lure would would actually allow the lure to work a lot better. Definitely. Like it's supposed yeah. to work, being the, the big wide clip that you explain. Absolutely, Absolutely. yeah. Definitely. The old brass snap swivel? The old brass snap swivel. <laughs> now, these have been around for as long as Dave has, and it's a pretty long time. Yeah. Um, but... Can't even say that. Yeah. <laughs> People you know, don't use them much anymore. No, they, they don't. It's, it's old school. And they are used predominantly now for, I guess, um, joining rigs. Yeah. You know, you tie your rig onto a, a little, you know, a brass ring or you just tie a loop in the end and you can just clip them straight on. Yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm not a huge fan. Uh, I think it's something that's had its day. The clip is reliable enough, but you, you wouldn't want to be catching anything too big on it. Um, I mean, I've got a, a size one instinct swivel here and it's it's rated to 25 kilos. But yeah. like I said, the, the mechanism, mechanism itself isn't really the most reliable, but they're great for those small, you know, whiting. Every day, if you take the kids down, you know, you can just... Clip yeah. a clip a, a rig and so I don't think brass is brass these days either. You do you do tend to get a bit of salt corrosion. And, yeah, that's you know, right. It's not like yeah. it was back in perhaps yeah. the fifties or sixties when it was. Whereas uh, what we're talking about next is the stainless steel, and you can get them either in silver or black. That's right. But the stainless steel is just a superb r rolling swivel, ball bearing. Yeah. It's fantastic. And this is where it starts to get quite fancy, I guess, when you start talking about swivels. They've got ball bearings in them so that, I mean, these are designed for game fishing, so the, the breaking strain on them is extraordinary. They've got a, a number seven here, which we, you'd, you'd typically rig on, say, 24 kilo gear, and it's rated to 182 kilos. Not, yes. not just squid. Yeah, definitely not, not just squid. Not just squid, no. If you're, catching squid that, if you're catching squid that big trolley, I want you to take me to where you're catching squid. No um, but... It's at ball bearings. You can you tie these onto the biggest of lures, catching the biggest of fish, and it doesn't make too much of a difference. Yeah. They're that hard to open. You almost need to get a set of pliers around them to really get that that clip off. So um, nice, guess, reliable. Uh, but I guess that uh, provides you with the strength. Oh, it has it? to That's be. It why. has to be. You'd be more concerned if you could freely open it with your with yeah. your fingers for the application that it's used for. Yeah. How strong is that one? That big one there. 273 kilos. Yeah, that's amazing. That'd it? almost hold you, Trelly. <laughs> yeah, almost. <laughs> Wouldn't it? <laughs> one leg. <laughs> one leg. <laughs> now, it's the last one. Uh, what's it called? It's called a no-knot fast snap. 
Okay, I want your opinion on this because I've never used them. I'm not sure whether you have, but uh, it's virtually like a little clip. And if you look at the picture that the viewers are seeing at home, it virtually just, you just clip your lure on yeah. and, and I guess you hope that it doesn't pull out that gap. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's very difficult for people to see the real thing, but it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty tight gap. Yeah. Uh, it's just a very quick way of getting a lure on and off, isn't it? Yeah. It Again, light tackle, like you say. It, you're using yeah, it for, I think know, that's a key. Uh, brim, things like that that aren't going to really pull that hard. Yeah. So. But I have got an alternative. Yeah. You get your mate to tie it on. <laughs> <laughs> there's one thing I can guarantee. Obviously, you've never seen me tie a knot, really. <laughs> there's, there's one thing I can guarantee about that is that I'd be absolutely buggered without my glasses yeah, trying well, to hoop onto that. that so I reckon, as, as Trally said, it, it serves a purpose. Uh, you know, if the eyesight's no good, there's a bit of arthritis, mm. you, you know, you don't want to sit there and spend half your fishing session retying yeah. lures and things. Not personally, not not for me. I'd much prefer to tie tie a loop knot. I, I don't like the extra lay, extra weight in front of the lure yeah. in in light application. Yeah, that's right. It's different when you're throwing a metal slice for a salmon or a tailor, where you know it's not going to smother your action. You belt them out as far as you can and wind them back. Yeah. There's nothing too yeah. finesse about it. They serve their purpose, um, but it's definitely a light application. Yeah. Thing. I suppose yeah. the idea with swivels is when you're sort of chasing fish or searching for fish. You want to change your lure as quickly as possible and yes. change multiple. So that's, right. that's where your clips come in and then some of your other knots, like, like um, purpose knots. But uh, these things, very, very fast. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Once you get them Boys, go. talking about tying rigs adds a lot of people uh, wondering, they come into the shop all the time, how do you tie a Port Phillip rig? How do you tie a Western Port rig? And they're quite different. How do you tie an offshore rig for snapper? Yep. Uh, there is one best way, if you like. Well, this is the thing with snapper Wait, rigs. There's yeah. there's a hundred different ways to tie them. Yeah. Um, we've prepared a short video to show you something that you may not have seen. I guess it's something a little bit different. I said Paul Worsling uses this in Port Phillip Bay. We're talking not tidal water. It's probably not suitable for somewhere like Western Port or Southern Port Phillip where you've got lots of tidal flow. But it's something a little bit different and it serves a great purpose. Let's have a look. Adam Ring tying a snapper rig. I'm going to show you very quickly how to tie a couple of Port Phillip snapper rigs to get you by. Now I know you've seen this a hundred times before and you're probably thinking, here we go, Port Phillip snapper rigs again. But it is absolutely crucial and very important you get this right so that your bait gets presented in the best possible way. Now to start off in its most basic form, cut yourself a length of litre. I've got a bit of 40 pound supple litre here. Typically I'd make these quite long. I'd like to give the bait plenty of chance to move around in any sort of tide and any sort of current. Very simple. I've got a glow-in-the-dark Shinto hook here. This is a 5.0. You can vary your size depending on your bait size and where you are fishing in Port Phillip Bay. Very simple uni knot just to lock off and tie the bottom hook. Trim your tag nice and close. You don't need tags hanging out everywhere to catch on your bait and tear them apart. Now this is something that Paul Worsling would have shown us quite a few years ago, which I'm sure is going to take off very quickly in the next few years. Before you lock off your second hook, slide your sinker down on top of the fixed hook at the bottom. Now this is a barrel sinker, you want to keep this nice and streamlined because this is designed to aid your casting. Now simply snell off your second hook. On all of your suicide snapper hooks, you've got a turned out eye. This makes this knot very, very easy. Come in from underneath. Now you can keep these fairly short. These are beautiful for your bigger baits, like your slab baits, chunk baits, squid heads, that sort of thing, where you really need to get those hooks sticking out nice and proud. Now with your snell, start away from where the actual eye turns around to meet the shank of the hook. By starting away from that, it just makes sure that that knot can't lock in that join and start damaging your knot. So working away from that join, simply wrap your leader down the shank of the hook, nice and neat. Keep wrapping, keep wrapping, keep wrapping. Now you want to wrap to roughly where the hook point would meet the main shank of the hook. It's then as simple as pinching it off with your fingers so it doesn't unravel. Bring the other end of your leader through the back end and come in from underneath. That's the one thing to remember with these octopus hooks is to always start from underneath that turned out eye. Pull that down nice and tight. Now that is ready to go. Now that's a simple snelled rig. The point of having the sinker in the middle is to keep all the weight forward. If you need to get those baits far away from the boat where the snapper are being quite shy, 
That keeps everything in line. The sinker doesn't go flying in the opposite direction to your bait, and that is whole and ready to go, waiting for those big snapper to snap up your baits. No wonder I never catch many snapper. I'm just nowhere near as good as you, Ads. It uh, very well demonstrated that rig. Yeah, it's, it's something, like I said, it's something a little bit different. I mean, having the swivel, uh, having the sinker, sorry, in between the two hooks is something that not yeah. a lot of people may have seen before. And it's pure and simply just designed to get you that little bit of extra distance on your cast. If the yeah. fish are being a bit quiet or you're in shallow water, you can get the baits away from the boat. The beauty with rigs like that is you can actually get one of those foam holders, the rig holders now, yeah. and sit in your garage, ignore your wife, and just tie 20, 30 of them for the season. Oh, well, you Have could, them all ready to go. You could be tying them now while you're, while you're watching the show. You yeah. Know? Kick back, relax. You know, said, uh, crack a can, have a look at talk and fishing and tie yourself a few rigs. Absolutely, yeah. So great stuff. Now, Western Port's very, very different. We might do that uh, maybe next week or yeah. the week after or whatever. So yep. Trelly, two hook rigs. So, you know, we use them quite a lot in snapper. Um, you use the old Pat and Oscar on whiting and things like mm. that. But in freshwater, do they ever use a two hook rig? No, not really. Don't no. really see it. You see the Pat Noster rig. Yeah. Um, you'll see like a, a running uh, sinker with the, with the hook underneath the type of rig. Yep. Uh, but not really a two hook rig. We don't use many pilchards up our way either. <laughs> <laughs> mm. The other thing is those. <laughs> you don't catch any out that way, no. No. Um, Adds the other thing is those Lumo hooks. And, you know, we spoke about them last week, all the things that glow in the dark. That's right. Uh, just some great fish being caught on those they're just ultra sharp they are a very good hook and of course we use them uh, I know we sell them through the shops yep. but we do use them every time I know a lot of the charter guys are now using them they're a fantastic hook aren't they yeah definitely and you know they're not as you know I guess basic as what do you think the the powder coat doesn't go over the hook point so you still get the best possible uh, hook up rate and the, and it doesn't flake off with the first 30 seconds being in the water I know they said the charter boys have been trying them out and they're having a good session and by the end there's still a bit of glow left on them so they're definitely well worth a look absolutely and uh, plenty of different sizes different patterns in those yep. uh, in those lumo hooks as well so they're very very good up next fisheries news and plenty more on talking fishing see you after this <laughs> Talking fishing. Talking fishing. And now it's time for the news. The fishery news. Sounds a bit fishy to me. And boys, a little bit of fisheries news around this week. I know this was from a couple of weeks ago, but we didn't give it a mention. But black market abalone ring cracked in a big fisheries bust. It was a pretty big one too. And I think abalone, like I think for the last, oh, it's gotta be 10 years, you know, there's been significant crackdowns. And I guess, unfortunately, you know, for the recreationals, there's been a scale back in the amount of days that you can go and get abalone, an absolute big scale back in your bag limits on abalone, size limits, things like that. So, uh, but it's because there is such a big black market and the value of them. And, you know, this one, uh, 14 people uh, were arrested um, months of planning, 75 DEPI officers. Uh, it, it was a massive bust. You know, it, it Have you ever eaten it? No, not really. So oh, it's sensational. sensational. Is yeah. it, I was going to say, is it as good as what warrants you know, 75 yeah. officers but it's get messy. involved with this massive It's messy, and I'm not, I'm not going to be a, a, you know, say that I'm an expert on abalone, but I have had them, like I've caught yeah. them myself, had them, mm. and you virtually just cut out a bit of meat, and it's like, oh, it's, I mean, it's not even like a scallop, but it's quite a, a, a hard meat. You slice, this is what I do, slice it into very thin slices. Yeah, so it's very easy to and, overcook, isn't it? And steam, yeah, I steam it, yeah. and you only steam it for a little yeah, bit, okay. and it's absolutely superb, but uh, obviously there's a big Asian uh, love of it, I guess, yeah. if you like, and, and a very big black market, so uh, another big bust in there. Uh, some great news, Dennis Napthine, the Premier, um, He's uh, announced $3.25 million to refurbish Mordialic Pier. Now, you'd have to say Mordialic Pier has got to be one of the best land-based snapper fishing structures in Port Phillip Bay right now. Oh, definitely. Um, when that big south westerly comes, it hits it right there, smack bang. Uh, I think they're, they're, they're going to extend it. Um, they're going to put baffles in to protect the boats and all the moorings that are inside Mordialic Creek. That's great news for Mordialic. Great news. Let's just hope it doesn't end up like what the Mornington Pier's like at the moment and they actually get it finished. If it actually took eight years shorter to build, it'll be a successful uh, project, <laughs> I think. So, yeah. uh, because Mornington Pier, it's going for the Guinness Book of Records. There's no doubt about that. So, um, yep, if it's a quick job, it's a good job. But yeah, but definitely. Fantastic news from the Premier on Mordialic Pier. Uh, Trelly, I wanted to bring this one up, Murray Cod Catch Limits, and uh, we we did speak about this about a month ago, yep. but I just, we've got you here now, you are the Cod Man uh, from up in Shepparton. From 1st of December 2014, new Murray Cod Catch Limits will apply to wreck anglers, 
they're going to a 50 to 70 centimetre slot limit statewide and a reduction in the bag limit from two to one fish uh, per day in rivers whilst ma maintaining the bag limit in lakes and impoundments to two fish per day. I'd love your opinion on it. You might have even sat on the panel, did you? Yeah, we, uh, we had some input to the panel um, mm. as far as uh, our ideas and things like that go. The, look, I'm not all over the, the one sort of limit thing. I'm yeah. not opposed to it yeah. because a lot of these regulations can be put in over a period of time and changed. Um, I can see a lot of sense in the slot limit that's being brought in from 50 centimetres to 70 centimetres because through that period, a Murray cod will grow through that period in around about three years. Yep. So the window that that fish can be caught is narrowed from the old 60 to you know, a metre type of fish. Yeah. So, so a metre, you know, 60 so centimetres. So the last spot limit was a metre, was it? Yeah, so metre, yeah. 60 centimetres to, you know, through to a metre. Um, they can be, you know, like 20 years in that period. Yeah. So by narrowing that, that size down, plus a fish in that slot limit of 50 to 70 might produce, say, 10,000 eggs, whereas once they grow bigger to 90 and a metre, they're producing 40,000 eggs and more, mm. so. What would you do with a metre long <coughs> cod, apart from being a trophy on the wall? Yeah, and that, that's the uh, you know, the advent of um, you know, smartphones and cameras and all that type of thing has mm. really um, increased the rate of catch and release. Yeah. So you know, a lot of guys get in the water and they get the fish out and they get their mate yeah. to take a photo. You can blow it up, you can put it in a big heavy frame and actually put a little window in and put the lure you caught in there. Yeah. And it looks fantastic on the wall and you, and you get to release the fish. So. Yeah. Uh, so it works really well. And I've got to say, that is a classic photo of Murray Cods these days. That's uh, right. Murray Cods yeah. Murray, these days. Yeah. The guys get in the water and take the photo in the water, which is quite good. Um, yeah. Unlike you know, awesome. a lot of the other species, you know, there's different ways to do the old whiting on the fingers, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You know, the snap that we saw yeah. earlier on. But the Murray Cod is in the water holding it. It's a great yeah. pick, isn't it? Don't see it with Barramundi, but... No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> funny <True>. about that. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, I guess you can do that in some of those places where yeah, you do exactly, catch yeah. them. So, yeah. And yeah. some of them grow quite, quite big. I mean, we've got one on the wall that's 1.5 metres long. Yeah, it's wow. in the shop. Um, and it was found dead floating, so the guys brought in and we got it mounted. But yeah. that big picture, that classic photo, yeah. um, and the fish gets to swim. Saw yeah. a cracker at the Melbourne Aquarium on Sunday. Oh, really? Oh, it was a Murray awesome. Cod. Yeah, yep. it's a big yeah. one in there. Yeah, there's a big one in there sitting in its. Is it in within tank. the slot limit, is it? Or no? Oh, it's definitely well out <laughs> yeah, of the slot limit. Well and my, and every my, time. my yeah. little girl loved it because she thought it was the old one from Cranbourne. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every, every, every time I go there, I look at the kingfish and I go, oh, I wish. <laughs> you probably, oh, probably wasn't allowed to take a popper in. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The recipes yeah. run around your head. Yeah. <laughs> so, Trelly, just getting back to those yeah. uh, the new limits, how's the feedback from customers in the shop? You know, what are they saying? Are they happy with it? Pretty good, Lynn. I've been in the shop, you know, almost 30 years now, and mm. the number of Murray Cod. And you started there today, when you're 45. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Aging well, aren't I? <laughs> the, um, yeah, so the, the number of Murray Cod that have been caught today, as yeah. opposed to back then, yeah. there's a lot more fish being caught. There's, there's heaps and heaps oh, more fish is. being caught. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, the um, and people just, you know, I think 90% of the uh, people who catch fish put them back, so that means 10% only sort of keep fish. So yeah. most of them are being put back, so which is a really good thing. And again, they get, they're not, they're like the yellow belly we were talking about, once you get to a certain size, they don't taste any good. Yeah. So, um, so but there's a lot more Murray Cod being caught now than, than you know, 20, 30 Let's years Let's keep ago. the freshwater flavour going. Tell us a little bit about trout cod. Are they coming back? Trout cod, if you fish between the wall at Mulwala, right down through uh, Cobram, take them all down to the Barmer Forest, they are like rats, honestly. They uh, like rats. You can put a wow. body grub this big in. Is that right? Put it down, and they'll go bang. And you'll often pick up a trout cod, a little bit bigger than the body grub. Mm. They are so aggressive. It's no wonder they, you know, that they probably decreased in numbers because people could catch them so easy. But yeah. um, honestly, and that, that's just through uh, protecting the waters, then reintroducing the species as yeah. far as um, you know breeding and that type of thing. So, so they're uh, stocking a few in Victoria. Are they stocking them in New South Wales as well. Yeah, well, that's New South Wales water. Mm. And then, oh, uh, yeah, of course, and then yeah. uh, Victoria, yeah. they do. Yeah, a lot of places too. Do, do yeah. they grow to the size of a of a Murray cod? Or I mean, yeah. what's a, what's a big trout cod? Oh, probably a big trout cod, probably four kilos, five kilos. Yeah, but that's a good fish. But in the old scale, because I'm thinking of the old scale, but about forty five pounds they can get up to. Wow. Yeah. So. Wow. Do you think it'll be very uh, soon? In fact, we might talk that about that after the break. Mm. I want to know, are you going to be able to catch them soon and put them on the dinner plate or whatever you do with the trout cod? We'll talk about that after the break. But Kramer's mailbag coming up next. Then we're talking fishing with Trelly. Back soon on Talking Fishing. Talking Fishing. Talking Fishing.
And plenty of mail coming through this week. I tell you what, there's some good stuff coming through too. <laughs> Boys, uh, let's kick it off. Phil Holt from Williamstown. Hi, guys. Why are you promoting the tea tree snapper comp? Isn't it one big slaughter? This is... <laughs> Comes up every year. It's, it's a well, touchy subject, well, but it's a good question. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. This is my thoughts. If you go out this weekend and have a look at how many boats are out on Port Phillip Bay fishing for snapper, and you ask every single one of them to congregate at Mornington Racecourse on sun, a sun, or Saturday or Sunday afternoon, you're probably going to have more fish, more people on the water than the tea tree comp. So there you go. Yeah. Um, it's just because they ask everyone to congregate That's with right. their fish. Yep. They have pretty strict rules around it. Yep. Uh, they have tried catch and release sections that haven't that haven't worked that well because yeah. people are entitled to take a fish. That's yeah. why we have yeah. bag and, and size limits. Uh, it's because people bring all their fish to one spot. It does look like a mass slaughter, yeah. but it's not. It's it's probably less fish than what's taken in the next month. Yeah, that's right. Out of Port Phillip Bay. What a lot of people don't realise as well. There's more to it than just catching a fish and taking it down to the Mornington Racecourse to get it weighed and measured and win a prize and whatnot. I've spoken to that many people over the last few years that they fish once a year yeah. and it's the tea tree snapper comp because it gives them an excuse to get their family down. There's guys that travel from your way, Charlie, up yep. in Shepparton that come down mm. to catch up with family that they've got down here mm. in Melbourne. It's the only time they catch up for the year and it's because it's of the, the tea Melbourne tree snapper comp. It's the Melbourne Cup long weekend. That's right. Yeah. So, listen, it's I understand what people are saying, but, but like you said, it's only seen as a as a mass slaughter because, like you said, you're asking people to congregate in one area. It's it's one of those things. Um, the comp's done under, it's done for the right reasons. Uh, and I think the Snapper Point Angling Club do a pretty good job at, at regulating all that. Absolutely. It's it's one of those things, you know, how does it going to hate? You know, the argument goes right across the board with fishing as far as that and hunting and all something. It's yeah. been sustainable uh, fisheries, uh, yep. it's a healthy fisheries. Yeah. There's nothing really, really wrong with it. I mean, no. you look at the, the amount of fish that go through markets, Sydney, Melbourne, that type of thing. Yeah. You know, throw the camera around there a couple of days yeah. a week. Yeah, we'll get to yeah, that in exactly. a minute, Trelly. Uh, Lachlan from Cranbourne, I want to try land-based gummy shark fishing. Where is the best place to go? Well, you have the best man working for you in Mark Keevney down That's at right. Tapwell Mornington. Where would be the best place to go for a gummy shark land-based right now? Uh, the back beaches, yep. uh, the Gunnamatta Surf Beach, uh, cruise around into Western Port, fish around Summers, Balnearing. There's some of the hottest, I guess, land-based gummy shark snapper pla uh, gummy shark and snapper places you can fish. So I'd be going down there for sure. Uh, one for you, Trelly, Graham Clark from Bo Morris. Hi gang, is it illegal to take a Murray cod out of the water to take a picture if it's closed season? Good question. Yeah, I know that's what we're asking you. Charlie. <laughs> yeah. Look, I think um, I think like we were talking about before, if you jump in the water and actually, if you don't mishandle the fish, I mean you obviously got to take the hooks out. If you're fishing for yellow belly or anything like that, the byproduct is Murray cod. Yeah. So, so you're allowed to lift them out of the water. Graham well, I, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, no. I don't but know is about it the legalities. Is it illegal? Of it. No, you don't I'm know. Not yeah. too sure about the legalities of it. Yeah, but we might try and chase that up. But if you can lip grip fish and, and obviously handle them correctly and put them back in the water, yep. um, rather than sort of lifting them out for a photo session, um, you know, it's, it's obviously a better way of handling yep. fish. And, so. and you're right. There's so many ways now to handle a fish. Well, like you said, yeah. with, with lip grips and, and the education mm. on handling a fish to take a photo is the best yeah. it's ever been. So yeah. you can definitely do the right way about it. That's yeah. right. Mind you, if you come up and you see a guy in the final shirt with a 12-inch felt knife, you're in pretty good. All right, boys. Last but not least, Steve from Rosebud. I am sick and tired of seeing the netters down here on the Mornington Peninsula. You can't find a whiting to save yourself, and there should be plenty this time of year. Are they going to ban netting or what? Well, well, this is mm. this has been the the big question, and and Dave, take it away. You've had all as much all to I do with say, this than any of us. All I can say for the people at home, get on to keepaustraliafishing.org.au, I think, or keepaustraliafishing.com.au. It's one of those. Google it. Keep Australia Fishing. There is a campaign going. It's got to be close to the political parties announcing something about netting very, very <coughs> shortly. Um, just keep up the campaign because seriously, there's a lot of reports about just no whiting around at the moment. So uh, <coughs> it's tough times. Let's see what happens after uh, you know the political parties have made their statements. If you'd like to write to me or these blokes, this is what you have to do. Send your mail to Kramer's Mailbag, Post Office Box 734, Patterson Lakes, Victoria 3197 or email kramer at ifish.com.au. Now, Trelly, back on to trout cod. Uh -huh. uh, 
Back in the old days, so you've been at your shop for 30 years and you were 45 when you started there. So back in the old days, trout cod would have been legal to catch, yeah? Yes, absolutely. Yep. And they have a bag limit? Oh, look, I can't, I can't remember when I was that age. <laughs> <laughs> Did they have a size limit? Uh, no, not really. I don't think there was any sort of like bag yeah. limits or size limits. But are, they, um, are they good eating? They, uh, uh, <laughs> answer that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll see if I get any <laughs> questions that Trelly knows the answer to. No, no, no. Very good. I did taste one that they, um, that was, uh, they privately, uh, um, harvested. Privately stocked. Yeah. yeah. Is there much of that going on? Private there is. stocking? There is actually because, you know, like most fish, you can go and buy them to, yeah. um, to release. So, yeah. and Murray Cod Yellow Belly is one of those things. So, you get a lot of guys with, you know, they might have a big uh, catchment of water with a winery, things like that, and they yeah. just um, love their fishing. So, they'll go and buy a heap of yellow belly or cod and put them in. Yeah. Um, and a cod in the, in the off season can be actually taken from private waters. Yep. So, getting back to the question that we were talking about uh, earlier on in the show, yeah. when do you think the day will come where people are allowed to legally fish for trout cod again? Yeah. A, Again, sustainability is the key word. Yeah. If you get to a point where there's some surveys done, some science put behind it, and we're catching fish of a certain size, which is a, a table size fish, I really can't see why we can't introduce uh, a slot limit on, on trout cod. Yeah, okay. Uh, like I say, there's heaps and heaps of small trout cod in the system, and, it, and, and they're getting bigger and bigger all the time. Yep. Um, so I, I can't see a problem with it. Uh, and I know there's a few lakes that are stocked, isn't there? Um, I'm just trying to think of the name. Sample, is it one of them? Yeah, there's a couple. Of, there's, a, there's an area between Euroa and Merton um, yeah. in there. Yeah. There's a few, there, and I believe they're putting them into Eildon. Yep. So, um, so there's, there's a few areas here. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, you'd hope maybe those lakes, you know, very controlled area that uh, you know some can actually be caught and so yeah. forth. So, yeah, yeah you no know, good stuff. Yeah. Um, trout, of course, a lot of people away on the Melbourne Cup weekend, heading up to places like Eildon, and uh, well, they're coming back from Eildon right now. Yeah. But uh, fishing sensational this time of year, I think. You know, it's not too cold to get down the well. You get a few brisk mornings, yeah. but. Yeah. The trout in places like that are sensational. The Goulburn River flow trolley is always topical this time of year because uh, <laughs> trout have been stocked into there yep. and quite often you're getting into this irrigation season now where we don't get any rain. That yeah. water <laughs> level in the Goulburn is pretty high, isn't it? The water level that's, that flows down the Goulburn is really, there's a lot of factors in it. There's, yep. there's a South Australian government that wants water and yep. the irrigation season. So, so when you say that, that, the Goulburn runs into the Murray, mm. yeah? Yep. And then down the Murray to South Australia. They need yep. water out of Eildon. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and they will dial in the, the times of year when they want that water. So yep. you're getting a fluctuation which is you know, not really a natural fluctuation in water because it's it's um, put down the river to um, for the needs of those people. Yeah. Then they'll have environmental flows on Yellow Valley time, which is about this time of year. They've got a couple of flows going through at the moment and that will stop just before cod opening. Yep. And hopefully we'll have some dry banks coming up to cod opening. But uh, the flow of the river is determined. There's a lot, a lot of factors in it. Yeah. So yeah, Moomba is another factor in, in river flow. Sorry? Mo uh, sorry, not Mo Moomba. That's Moomba. the river here, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, I actually the thought southern it was a <laughs> and I think Graham Kennedy used to be the king of Moomba <laughs> yeah, one day. The Southern 80, which goes from oh, yeah. Chukin to, uh, to um, uh, down to the Weir. Yeah. Um, and it's if you notice then, they keep the level of water exactly the same for three weeks because they go down the river and they mark all the yep. uh, all the logs, bits and pieces for the skiers, and they've got to keep that water level the same for three weeks. Yeah. So it's a good little secret if you if you're going fishing up the Murray, pick on that time of year around the Southern 80, and you'll find the lead up to that you've got constant river flow. Who would have thought when God created the world, if He did, mm. that they'd be regulating the water <laughs> at the Murray River for a water yeah. skiing race? That's Trelly. right. Uh, yeah. And we're trying to get water out, uh, in, yeah. out of Rocklands and into yeah. Tolondo. Yeah. Yeah. And we're talking about regulating for three, and good on them, because I know it's a very, yeah. very big race. So. Not to mention the paddle steamers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's go back to saltwater ads and uh, talk about Port Phillip Bay. Down that southern end is starting to fire a little bit, and I think this time of year is a great time of year down the southern end of Port Phillip Bay because come late December, there are thousands of boats there and quite often a lot of fish shut down. It's quite difficult, but that this time of year is good. The whiting are a little bit tough, as we heard in uh, in the mailbag segment earlier on, but you know some of the flathead on the sandbanks, they're coming up into the warmer, warmer water and things like that. It's beautiful fishing down there at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, well, I guess the southern part of Port Phillip goes through its little transition period now. Like I said, the, the water's starting to warm up a little bit. The, the big breeding calamari are in, so they're as big as they're going to get you know, right now. all year. Yep. They're, yep. they're huge at the moment. Yeah, plenty the, of eggs amongst the, the females too. The, the whiting are going to get better. Um, it is early, and I know there's discussion of netting and things like that, but they are only going to get better. The flatties are going to get better. 
uh, it's a, just a great place to be at the moment. Absolutely, and the other thing is the surf beaches. If you yeah. want to get your last bit of salmon before come December when all <coughs> the surfies are there and you can't walk on the beach because it's chock-a-block, now's the time. A couple more quiet weekends throughout November. December's probably going to get very, very busy. And there's fish about. We can get into the, you know, it can be comfortable standing there fishing for salmon on a surf beach in shorts and a T-shirt, so yeah. make the most of it. Yeah, not the waders and the thermals <laughs> and the other set of thermals over the top of that. So some fantastic fish. You also get the trevally, a uh, few yellow eye mullet. Uh, you can get the odd whiting amongst them as well. You know, yeah, the yeah, definitely. Yeah, you don't hear about it much, um, but it's definitely worth a go. Fishing close, a lot of people ignore the the disturbance in the water really close to the beach. That's where you're going to pick up all your yellow eye mullet and your trevally. So there's no reason the whiting won't be in there. Beautiful. Get down to the back beaches of the Mornington Peninsula. Coming up on Talking Fishing, this week's hot spots and what's coming up on C31 Fishing. Talking Fishing. Fishing. Hello, Richie Minnow here. It's now time for this week's fishing hotspots on Talking Fishing. Marvellous. Tell you what, the old Richie Minnow knows where the fish are. <laughs> he knows where the fish are. Hotspots, let's talk about them. Altona number one. I just think that little bit of warmer water has gone up the northern end of Port Phillip Bay, heading right towards Tackworld Laverton, Trelly. It has, excellent. And uh, Altona just is on fire. A lot, a lot of boats here now. And we're talking about long queues at the ramps and all that sort of stuff. The traditional stuff that comes with snapper season up the northern end of the bay. Yep. It's, uh, eight, I'm hearing fish eight to 10 metres is probably about the best spot. Yeah, it's, and it's a little fisherman's dream down there. There's plenty of structure. They said it's nice and shallow, so I don't have to fish heavy jig heads. Yep. Uh, it's yeah, great down there. Uh, I know we're sticking a lot around Port Phillip Bay, but that's where it all, is all happening. <coughs> and Karam is the second hotspot for the week. Absolute capital. And we're going to see those big captures, like I said earlier on the program, 20 or 30 fish. Uh, a day or a session, yep. uh, and I know people have got to really, you know, release them properly if they're going to have those sort of sessions, or they've got the family out and having a bit of fun. But Karam is certainly going to be a hot spot. Fish anywhere from yeah. ten if it's blowing <laughs> out to twenty-one. Yep, and there's a lot of fish starting to school up now in eighteen metres of water, which I guess is you know one of the most popular spots out of Karam. So you can basically flick the sounder on from ten to twelve metres and sound all the way out. One of the beauties is that. Uh, the new car park that's all been asphalted, yep. the line marking now is absolutely flowing beautiful. So it's a hot spot, but it's a hot spot that flows pretty good. Mornington's the third hot spot. Mornington on fire again, those yep. fish that love that deep water 20, 21 metres off Mornington. Um, again, you know, it's it's a lot of boats getting out there around Mornington, even down to Mount Martha now. Yeah, it is, and it's and it's good. There's finally Finally something to keep us going over at Mornington. It was a little bit quiet there, but the fish are already schooling up in the deep. There's guys catching them off the pier. There's yeah. loads of calamari around pretty much everywhere from Frankston through to Portsey. So depending on what the weather's doing, you know, get on the rocks and catch a snapper, cruise out to 20 metres, catch a snapper, there's fish everywhere. Yeah, and uh, some you know boat ramps, again, you've got Martha Cove down there, which is magnificent. I think yeah. a lot of people forget about that, and you get to Frankston, it's packed. Yeah. You get to and Patterson Lakes, it's packed. And Mornington's you get to Mornington. not, a, it's not a big ramp at Mornington. It no. doesn't house that many, I guess, Well, the trailers, ramp's the right size, it it's the car park, yeah, that's, it's yeah. wrong. <laughs> that's right, so uh, yeah, Mount Martha's definitely worth a look, I yeah, reckon. Yeah, get into Martha Cove because you come round along from Martha Cove and it's quite easy to, yep. to access a lot of area from there. You know, if you want to go out the back of the shipping channel, out the back of Mud Island, anywhere, easy access that yeah. sort of places. So we so don't experience that up where we are. The Murray no. River, we just go to the next bend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These guys, these guys are crazy. Was that easy. <laughs> Do you have to pay Something $15 is. to launch <laughs> on, on the next no, bend on the Murray? It, no, no. Yeah. And well, then I'm when you go the to the next bend, you've got to put... Don't talk too much. You go to the next bend, Charlie, and you've got to put another $15 in the next meter. Let's head over to Western Port and the middle spit as the fourth hotspot is just absolutely on fire. And that's been kept a little bit quiet. Big King George Whiting. Yeah, the Whiting are moving up onto the banks now. The water's just getting to that nice temperature. Uh, very similar to the start of our snapper season, the fact that the fish are probably not as many around, but the quality that you're getting are anywhere between 38 and 42 centimetres. So uh, the big fish moving up into the shallows, exciting times ahead for the whiting, I think. Absolutely. And make sure you're prepared for a 40 to 45 centimetre whiting. Don't fish too light. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know we've upgraded a few of the rods that we have in stock now specifically for heavy whiting fishing. Yep. Uh, because two years ago, I think they were a little bit quiet last year, the big ones, but two years ago, it was a very, very big fishery. Another place that's absolutely on fire as a hot spot is Anderson's Inlet. Again, King George whiting, land-based. It's yeah. sensational. Yeah, the, the Ando's is a bit of a, 
bit of a sleeper. You get these nice big sandbanks, which are easily accessible from, from the shore. So uh, the, the whiting, again, starting to move up onto the banks. Uh, again, we're in that transition period, so there's plenty plenty of salmon getting through the system still as well so heaps of options there too absolutely and last but not least as a hot spot to londo reservoir i know we've been talking about trying to get water in there and it's doing it tough if you don't get to londo if you don't get to Tolondo in the next few weeks and, and you might only have a few weeks mm -hmm. that place is going to get really hot the yeah. fish are going to shut down uh, and you just hope it's not all over oh, and, you just and get hope there. It's a trophy fishery. Yeah. It's a trophy fish fishery. We, we've been speaking to Trevor Holmes consistently. Uh, it's getting that low that can, they're starting to get concerned about a yeah. fish kill. So get down there and make the most of it before this water starts getting dangerously low. Yeah. yeah. And the next thing that'll be around the corner is an algal bloom. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you've got to be... Uh, Surprising you know, those fisheries, they're like, uh, you've got, you got the balance between irrigation water yeah. and fisheries. Yeah. yeah. So you can thank the irrigated farmer for putting the... The, the lake in or the dam in, yeah. but then we're trying to protect the we go and stock the fish. So yeah. there's a real balance in there, isn't there? It, there is, and I guess that's the sad thing, Trelly, is that it's you know it's all um, yeah. you know it's it's unnatural, I guess. You know, it's, yeah, it is to a degree, uh, absolutely. You know, we've yeah. we've dammed up rivers for certain reasons and that yeah. sort of thing. So um, yeah, it's just it's just what we're going to live with, isn't it? And try mm. and manage it the best way. And uh, there's all these competing interests, I guess. Yeah. That's right. Well, we're mm. going to keep fighting for the fish shows, that's for sure. <laughs> it's that's too good the, not to. That's yeah. the hot spots for the week. But Adam, just uh, before we go, we've got a couple of minutes to chat. Um, calamari in Western Port too. <coughs> we, we, I know we haven't featured it on tonight's show, but some very big models coming from the Tyre Bank and the Quail Bank. <coughs> Excuse me, this you, cough's you just, killing me. You just reply. Well, I die loudly here <laughs> on live television. Feel free to cough while I ask there that we question. Go. Yeah, that's right. I'll just make sure Quail I will ba Quail Bank and the Tyre Bank fishing very, very well. Massive. Calamari. Yeah, big calamari starting to push up, like we're seeing through most parts of the port and in Port Phillip Bay, but uh, push up into the shallows there. You're fishing anywhere between two and four metres of water. If that's not happening, cruise down to Flinders because the models down there are insane. They're catching them off the pier, they're catching them in the boats. Uh, the middle spit, which we spoke about in the hot spots, uh, while well, you've got the whiting rods out, throw a squid jig around because mm. they're really spreading themselves out. They're not confined to one little area, one little patch. Uh, I spoke to Jesse Caulfield, who used to work for us at Mornington, and uh, he basically was accidentally catching squid. He was yeah. whiting fishing, there's squid under the boat trying to trying to eat whiting. He's up on the banks catching them on yeah. jigs. They're everywhere and yeah. they're big. Trelly, do you know the trend in colours over on the Geelong side? Queenscliff, I mean, is obviously a really good spot for calamari this time of year too. Yeah. Is there a trend in colour at the moment for over the your side? the squid jig itself? Yeah. White is the, yeah. the biggest seller yeah. is white. We say yeah, that so often. For 40 same. years, the Japanese tried to master yeah. the colour, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and but, here we are going. But I'd recommend about 40 different colours in your team. <laughs> yeah. True yeah. businessman, Charlie. Well played. <laughs> uh, and and, and size-wise too. I mean, uh, you know, you can still catch them on 2.5. But some of those bigger yeah. squid jig do catch the big squid. Oh, I'm a massive believer. Yeah. Big jigs for for big squid. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, it's surprising how I many those bigger ones we get through. But yeah, and they're yeah. so well made and so well weighted. No longer do you. You know, you cast out a size four jig in three metres of water and just plummets itself to the bottom and end up leaving it there. Yeah. They're so well weighted and neutrally balanced. It um, it really opens, I guess, opens up the fishery. You can fish big jigs. Boys, time to have a look at what's coming up on C31 Fishing this week. And Wednesday morning, as always, 6.30 in the morning is a rip of a show, Fishing Down Under. You've got to catch that one before you go to work. Then on Thursday, 6.30 in the morning, Australian Fishing Network. 9.30 Thursday night, Go Charlie, Savage Seas Adventures. And on the fly at 10 o'clock. Friday, it starts in the morning, Catch and Cook. And 7 o'clock on the fly for a little bit of fishing. If you just want that little taste, uh, you know, fishing before you go to work on Friday morning, that's the one to get, just catch and cook and on the fly. <laughs> Two little great programs. On Saturday, like we always say, the extravaganza starts 9.30 a.m. Savage Seas Adventures, 10 a.m. on the fly, 10.30 a.m. Fishing Down Under, 11 a.m. Australian Fishing Network, 11.30, that's fishing, and 12 noon catch and cook. One, one two, three, four, five, six in a row. Yeah, your wife is going to divorce you if you watch all of those. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Saturday, 6.30pm <laughs> is That's Fishing, 7pm Fishing Down Under and 7.30 Australian Fishing Network. While it's still light outside, just creep in and uh, <laughs> go and watch some fishing on, on Saturday night. So some good shows there and plenty of good fishing and also, uh, you know, there's great tips and te techniques on some of those and we often see before our program tonight, Catch and Cook, and you just see some of uh, the work that Gina and Ron uh, do on catch and cook. Yep. It's, uh, you know, it's one of the beauties, I guess, of fishing is some of the stuff that you can see in the fry pan 
or in the oh, oven yeah. or however you choose to do it. That is what fishing's all about. But it's, uh, it's a great little hobby. It's a great little food source. Anyway, that's it for Talking Fishing. Hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget, Talking Fishing will run right through until the end of April 2015, a massive season ahead. This time next week, the big horse races will be over and we look forward to Jimmy Cassidy joining us in the studio to talk fishing next week. Until then, have a great week and enjoy your fishing. We got all you need, just take a look. Watch those fish jump on your hook. So just relax and take your time. Enjoy the show, then drop us a line. Talking fishing, talking fishing, nothing but fishing. We're talking fishing. Talking fishing, talking fishing, nothing but fishing. We're talking fishing. Talking fishing.